investigating how state legislatures funnel education funding to favored vendors. It was reported that Weight Watchers collected about $300,000 per year between 2011 and 2016 while working with lobbyist Beth Clay. Powerful storms causing problems throughout parts of the central and southern U.S. Fox's Matt Finn reports from Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're in a neighborhood about six miles west of the International Airport in Tulsa, where the National Weather Service confirms a tornado touched down this morning. And this neighborhood also hit hard by a very powerful storm that several neighbors tell us appear to be a twister as well. There are downed power lines and roadblocks, large trees that have basically crushed homes. And we spoke to a young girl who says she helped helped rescue some of her neighbors. At least a, one person was injured by a tornado near Tulsa. About a dozen homes confirmed damaged. Tech companies led the way on Wall Street on Tuesday as the markets gained some ground. The Dow gained 197 and the Nasdaq rose 83 and a third. The S&P 500 gave investors 24 points. Find more news and information online at onenewsnow.com. For American Family News, I'm Steve Jordahl. The loss of a child through abortion, miscarriage, or stillbirth affects the emotional health of families. Feelings of anger, sadness, and regret can be overwhelming. There is hope and healing in the aftermath of a reproductive loss. Call the International Helpline at 866-482-LIFE to talk with someone who has been where you are and healed to help others. Your call is confidential. 866-482-LIFE. Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media and the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment, let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III, joined by the full J-squared contingent, Mr. Jeff Reed on my left, Mr. Jason Tross on my right, Mr. Marty Sparks lighting up the dark from the screening room. And we are excited to bring you today's edition of the Hamilton Corner. Let me warn you now, and I'll do this again. Before the second segment, we, Lord willing, we are planning to have a guest on the program, and we are going to have some very candid conversations, radio appropriate, of course, but nevertheless, candid conversations about a subject matter, and I'll just let you know it's related to the Equality Act, uh, that those of you with younger listeners, you may want to uh, pause the video or the radio or, if you're, or you, on the podcast, you might want to come back to this when you've had an opportunity maybe to digest it yourself. And then talk to your young ones about it because we are going to have, as I said, a, a pretty candid conversation. I will give another disclaimer before we start the second segment uh, just to make sure everybody understands uh, that all hearts and all minds are clear that uh, we, we're going to go into the deep end. man. And I, and I think the and we'll get into this, I'm sure. The failure of being candid about some of these conversations has have allowed darkness to metastasize, you know. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to that. Let me uh, remind those of you who are in the Greens. I'm sorry. Let me get this right. Those of us who are in the Greenwood, Mississippi area, Greenwood, Mississippi area. Um, I'm looking forward to joining the Saints of God at the Turner Chapel AME Church uh, on Wednesday, June 5th at 7 p.m. I will be preaching at that church. And so I'd love to see those of you who are in the area, or those of you who want to come over, or willing to come over to the area. It's going to be a great time of worship and delving into the Word of God. Uh, man, I'm so excited about sharing about this. I, I knew when I received the invitation that this was an invitation from the Lord. So um, I, I'm extremely excited about that. Um, as well as the Marriage, Family, and Life Conference. Uh, I was talking to the fellows before we came on the air. Man, it's, it's really easy to reduce the things that we're seeing around us to, you know, the so-called political culture wars or whatever, whatever. But the reality is that we are engaged in spiritual warfare, man. And the enemy is not playing. You know, he's not trying to pacify us and our children. He doesn't want us, you know, to have, oh, a nice little cute children. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's seeking to accomplish. And in the face 
of the enemy's efforts. We, as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, need to be equipped. There's some issue we need to be equipped. And so I, I man, I almost want to uh, say, like, Apostle Paul, I compel you, <laughs> you know, to come to this conference because it's, it, it is um, it's, it, just enough is enough. Man, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm tired of seeing the Lord's bride being waylaid, man. I'm tired of seeing the enemy snatching uh, souls. I'm tired of seeing that. You know, I'm tired of seeing the pulpits in our country anemic on the issues where they need the biblical truth. But because of political correctness and because, just to be blunt, a desire for popularity and large crowd size, we dance around the word of God. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Because as we do these things, souls hang in the balance. Eternity hangs in the balance. Sorry, I didn't mean to get amped already. But, um, yeah, it's one of those days, folks. So go to AFR.net. If you're interested, man, I'm, getting, I'm so encouraged about the people that are signing up to come to the conference, and I'm, I'm telling you, I've, I've said this before, I'd hate for you to intend to come and wait too late, and then it's sold out. I'd, I'd hate for that to happen to you. So I'd encourage you to get in uh, your registration now. AFR.net, UrbanFamilyTalk.com is where you can register. Uh, because, man, we're living in the last days. Man. We're living in the last days. And enough is enough. Enough is enough. All right, let's get going, shall we? <laughs> I wish y'all could see Jeff's face. Well, you probably can if you're watching the live stream. Oh, let me say this too. Uh, in the last couple of days, we've had some difficulty with the YouTube live stream. Thankfully, we've got that all worked out. So I know there's some faithful YouTubers who are out there. And if you have not yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Because uh, while they're letting us on it, we're going to take advantage of it. Uh, who knows how long we'll be on it, but we'll see. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to the Hamilton Corners channel on YouTube. Uh, and thank you to all of those faithful Facebookers. Man, it's crazy. These people be in here. And all of you who are listening on the radio and on the podcasters, man, it, it, I, still, I am still amazed uh, that people tune in. Let's go into the word, shall we? Proverbs chapter 27, two verses. Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. Just a reminder for those who may not be aware or if you may be new to the program, um, one of the critical components of understanding the word of God is first identifying the fact that it is literature. Because it is literature, a, a discipline of literary interpretation is called hermeneutics. Applying that discipline to the Bible is called biblical hermeneutics. The core of biblical hermeneutics is understanding that there are multiple genres of literature in the scripture. You have prose, you have poetry, you have narrative, you have wisdom literature. The book of Proverbs is wisdom literature. And specifically, proverbial wisdom literature is a particular type of literature that you can delve into the depth of an individual verse with that individual verse on its own. You cannot do that. You cannot take the approach, the hermeneutical approach that you t apply to Proverbs. You cannot apply that same approach to, for example, Acts or Joshua. Okay, but in Proverbs, you can do that. I'm saying that because I don't want anybody to misconstrue uh, the approach that I employ in the book of Proverbs and try to, you know, lift that from Proverbs and apply it to another genre of literature in the scripture because you'll find yourself uh, doing great damage to the text. If you do that. So here in the book of Proverbs, we're going to read these two verses. And these verses really. They're very, 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 very weighty. Here we go. Better is open rebuke <laughs> than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Perfuse are the kisses of an enemy. Read those again. Verse 5, Proverbs 27, verse 5, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse, or the King James and NASB, say deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Now let's delve into this a little bit. Better, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Why is that the case? Because when there is open rebuke, open rebuke allows the recipient of that rebuke the opportunity to consider the course of their ways, to consider the course of the path that they are pursuing, and to make a correction if a correction is in order. Hopefully, and I learned this, and I'll tell, share you guys, share this with you guys. Uh, I learned this from my father. My father said to me, Abraham, God can use whomever he wishes to speak to you. 
So even if you have a man who is widely known as to be one who is given to intoxicants of the liquid variety, y'all know what I'm talking about, the issue that should the issue that should grab your attention is not the condition of the man. It should be whether or not the man is speaking truth. That's what my dad told me. <laughs> so if somebody says something to me, and of course, obviously, use common sense and reasoning. Um, the issue is not the, who is saying it. The issue is whether or not they're telling the truth. So if Jason says something to me, or Jeff says something to me, which has happened on numerous occasions, kind of along the lines of, ah, I don't know if you should have said that one, eh? The issue is not that it's Jeff and Jason speaking. The, ish, the question is whether or not what they're saying is true. Now, the additional benefit I have, because I know these men, and Marty, you're in there too, that I know they wouldn't say something to me because they have some nefarious and malevolent intentions. So it is to my benefit to take what they're saying and to consider it. Now, just because I'm considering it doesn't mean I have to agree with it. But the open rebuke gives me the opportunity to consider it. Now, this is what the proverb writer is saying. Open rebuke is better than hidden love. Why? Because hidden love, the person with the hidden love, they see the potential error. They see. Abe, hey, you probably shouldn't have said that. But because they place more importance on the absence, or should I say, or the appearance of loving me, even seeing the potential for error and the damage it could cause, they would rather keep it to themselves. And so the proverb writer is saying that is secret love. Why? Because they are secreting what they have available to enable me or to enable you to be better. Remember how 1 Corinthians chapter 13 describes love. And this is why, man, we have to take the, the, the Hollywood efforts to redefine love for us and throw that in the garbage, man, because it's trash. The Bible describes love on display. Love doesn't rejoice in wickedness. Love takes no celebration in wrongdoing. In fact, love only rejoices with the truth. So if these men see something or see me going down a particular path or they see me heading for a cliff, it is not love for them to keep that to themselves. Now, open rebuke allows me the opportunity. In fact, Je Jeff and I had a conversation just this week, and we were talking. And he said, man, Abe, I'm glad we could have this conversation. I said, man, listen, Jeff, I love you more than whatever topic of conversation we have. So whatever the issue is, man, we can talk about it. Rather than have an idea in your head and keep that quiet, and in the name of so-called love, you keep it secret. That's what the world is trying to do. They're trying to tell you, let love trumps hate. Let love, let love win. What they're really saying is you shut up and sit down. When you are saying, no, I am telling you this because eternity hangs in the balance. Then the proverb writer goes on and ups the ante. It says faithful. Listen to this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. So it goes from speaking about open rebuke being better than secret love. It then says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Why are the wounds faithful? Because they come from a friend. You have to understand this. <laughs> so you have two different individuals. You have surgeons and you have butchers. What do surgeons do? Surgeons use extremely sharp instruments to cut, to apply incisions. But the purpose of the cutting is to heal. Surgeons don't cut to destroy or to consume or to abuse or to, you know, to, to de de demolish. Surgeons cut to heal. There's some things <laughs> that you can't just put ointment on. In order to get the cancer out, some things you're going to have to apply an incision. But the incision is made for the purposes of healing. Then the proverb writer contrasts the faithful wounds of a friend the cuts that are applied for the express purposes of healing, contrast that with the deceitfulness of the kisses of an enemy. Now remember the parallels. Open rebuke, better than secret love. Remember what I said about secret love. You see there's a problem, but you won't say nothing. Because you, call, you, you consider the absence of tension 
to be of higher important value than the well-being of your friend or brother. Profuses are the kisses of an enemy. Why are they profuse? Why are they deceitful? The kisses of an enemy are deceitful because they are promulgated. They are devised to appease the emotion and to conceal the fact that danger lies ahead. That's why the proverb writer calls them an enemy. Over rebuke is better than secret love. Why? Because secret love is no love at all. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Why? Because they exist to assuage the emotions, to calm down the superficial surface level concerns, even though you know that that's a cliff. That's a cliff. This is why I'm telling you, these Hollywood types, these movies, these celebrities, man, these folks are enemies. They want to take something that we see the Bible declares to be abominable. They want to take something that we've seen Sodom and Gomorrah judge for. They want to take something that not just in Sodom and Gomorrah, but read Judges chapter 19, where it wasn't only in that city called Sodom, but look how the Lord dealt with his own people in Israel. Man, we have got to wake out of this stupor. Because I'm telling you, Jesus said it himself, when the enemy appears, he appears only for what purposes? Stealing killing and destroying it doesn't even matter if he comes and his initial presentation is filled with kisses remember how jesus was identified by judas with a kiss many of these things are offered the kisses of an enemy are offered to assuage the surface level emotions to get them to tamp down a bit in spite of the fact that you recognize that there's a cliff that you're about to careen over Protecting First Amendment rights. Hi, I'm Matt Staver with Freedom's Call. President Trump made an important announcement during the National Day of Prayer a few weeks ago. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services just released a final rule that protects the conscience of health care workers and organizations. The rule states that people and entities do not have to provide or participate in services like abortion, sterilization, or assisted suicide procedures that violate their religious or moral beliefs. This is good news. President Trump has fulfilled his promise to protect the unalienable right of conscience. Now people won't be bullied out of the health care field just because their moral and religious beliefs. No one should be forced to take another person's life. And what day could be more fitting to protect religious liberties than on the National Day of Prayer? Stand up for your religious freedom and stay informed at Liberty Council's website, lc.org. That's lc.org. Hi, this is Steve Tiber with 8 Days of Hope. We've been all over the country helping disaster victims who lose everything. It's truly a blessing. I really don't have the words to express. And yet they see a glimmer of hope when a volunteer shows up. Building the home, that's the second reason we're here. The number one reason is to share the gospel and, and give them hope. It's everything that's right in America. I mean, it really represents the, the best that we have to offer. That's one of the main reasons for doing it, is being able to be the hands and feet of Jesus and coming out and working with so many wonderful volunteers. I just feel like it's important in this day and age to teach a child uh, how to serve. Please go to our website, 8daysofhope.com, and click on Get Involved. Submit your email address, and the next time we go anywhere with a disaster, we'll invite you to come along as well. I love coming in the job room because you can see these pieces of paper, they aren't just a piece of paper. Right. It's a family that's hurting, and it's a gospel opportunity. And you know, I just thank God, you know, for this moment. I mean, I'll be back in my home, and I know it's going to be awesome. Come love others with 8 Days of Hope. Brian Fisher here with today's Life and Liberty Minute. The Democrats have been salivating about having Bob Mueller testify before Congress. It will never happen because Mueller has everything to lose and nothing to gain. What the Democrats seem to forget is that Republicans get to ask questions, too. DOJ guidelines only offer two options for special prosecutors, either indict or shut up. So Republicans will want to ask why, if DOJ regulations forbid inclusion of any derogatory information about a subject who is not indicted, why was President Trump smeared with lies and innuendo for the entirety of Volume 2? They'll want to know when Mueller knew Trump was not guilty of collusion. They'll want to know why the unverified steel dossier was used to get FISA warrants and whether illegal surveillance is spying. Mueller would rather be eaten by ants than answer those questions. Catch Brian Fisher on Focal Point, weekday afternoons at 105 Central on American Family Radio. 
shining light into the darkness. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. And I want to remind you uh, that we're going to have some pretty candid conversations uh, on human sexuality and identity right now. And if you have some young people that are around and and, and you want to uh, govern the introduction of these areas, uh, I just want to invite you to do that because we are going away into some uh, heavy areas now. Uh, so I want to make sure everybody has enough time and opportunity to do that. Now, with that warning, I guess you would say, I'm so excited to have on the program with me uh, a, d- a dear brother in the Lord who I was f- learned a little bit about him before ever meeting him, following some of the work he had been doing from a distance. Uh, and then on a recent trip uh, where I was speaking to a group at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, uh, this brother was there, and this is none other than Professor Robert Oscar Lopez, who is a professor at the South Western Baptist Theological Seminary. Robert, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. It is such a pleasure to be on your show. Man, it is my pleasure to have you on my program. Um, it's just, <laughs> man, what can I say? These, these are the times that I think the scripture was pretty clear in warning us that were coming. And, and just to, to get right into it, over the weekend I read a piece that you wrote that was published in the stream that I would commend to all of those who are listening uh, to pick this up uh, and, and read it. It's titled The LGBT Juggernaut, Time for Christians to Face Our Failures. And in it, uh, Robert, you, you, know, you, just, you, know, you just weighed in on some things that I'd been saying uh, behind the scenes. And I think part of it is because of where I'm from, you know, being from New Orleans, Louisiana, and being confronted with some of the things that are being discussed popularly, I think some people who may not be as familiar with it, and you, you know way more than even I do in, the, in these particular areas, uh, we've kind of soft-pedaled the conversation for so long, and then we wake up, and it feels like, wait a minute, the cultural uh, foundation has literally uh, shifted under our feet, and how did all of this happen? But before we get in too much into that, I want to give you an opportunity to just share, share a little bit of your testimony with our listeners so they can have a bit of context for the conversation that we're going to have now. Well, it's pretty simple. My mom was gay. She was in a relationship with a woman from the time I was a a toddler until my mother died when I was 19. I did not grow up with my father around, so I had somewhat of an experience of growing up with a gay couple, and I myself was inducted, if you will, into the world of gay sex at the age of 13 by some older teenage boys who got me drunk and I really just bought the propaganda from the gay community for years. I thought that it must be that I was born that way. That must have been who I was. But I hated what I was actually doing. And I thought that every time I hated it, it was because I wasn't accepting myself more. I needed to do work on myself. I needed to confront my internalized homophobia. I blamed myself that maybe I just needed to lose weight and look better to attract better guys. But finally, at the age of 28, I met a woman and I fell in love and I realized that all of that was a lie. Mm. And I don't think it was just a lie for me. Um, I think that it's a lie for everybody. I don't think anybody is gay because we talk about gay as if it's this abstract thing and we pretend that there isn't a brutal reality that takes place when two men, I'll just stick to the gay men because that's what I know, um, when two men close the doors and get into bed together, they do things that people would universally find really um, just unseemly. And there's no way around it. If you have two men with male bodies, there's really nothing that they can do to express physically their love for each other that isn't going to be harmful. Now, and I, I don't think that anybody is gay, because I don't think that anybody, even the people who call themselves that, can really look at what they're doing and say, yes, this is what I was made for. This is what my fate compels me to do. I can't stop doing this. Um, and, and this is my identity. It, it doesn't make sense. I think it's just a mass delusion, similar to when large amounts of people believed in communism or believed in the Nazis. It's just something that large amounts of people have signed on to, and now they've gotten in so deep that they just can't look at the basic reality of it. And we've gotten so many layers removed from that physical reality that I don't even know what we're talking about half the time anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I mean? I know exactly what you um, mean. But that's what I said in that piece, that yeah. it's just, you know, with the Equality Act, this locomotive train is like 10 inches from our nose. Mm. I mean, the fact that an act that was that sweeping, that's going to redefine civil rights law, it's going to enshrine in law 
that historically gay people and trans people have an equal amount of historical claims to black people, which is absurd. Absolutely. You know, uh, that's going to be put in the law. It's going to redefine what the government can regulate, what the government can prohibit, what the government can penalize, not only private businesses and what kinds of private businesses, but even just all activities, whether they're commercial or not, recreation, uh, amusements, all of these are words from the law. There's going to be a police force basically watching everything we say and do. And the fact that this law got this far, I just feel at this point now we've got to just go back to the basics and confront what we are talking about and get the public to be more frank about what they are referring to when they refer to the fact that people are gay or people are trans. You're talking about brutal physical realities, and ultimately the gay rhetoric just doesn't add up. Now, I'm glad you you, you parked it there because I want to make sure everybody understands this. Now, you are saying this and having lived what would be described as, you know, a homosexual lifestyle for how long? 15 years, and I I was 13. I had grown up in it. So really Mm -hmm. it's like 28 years I was in that community. And you are saying right now, Something that, um, and I know you're very familiar with this, but a while back, Hunter Madsen, and I forgot the other guy's name, Jeff, you might pull it up for me, wrote the book After the Ball, and Mm -hmm. it was the playbook that has been implemented socially to get the United States of America to embrace same-sex marriage, and one of the key tenets, and this is where, this is why I gave this this warning before we started the program, and and obviously we need to do this in such a way where it's it's conducive to radio, uh, but one of the key tenets was to get the attention off of the physical activity that goes down in private, right? Y'all, you get what I'm saying? And to yes. focus exclusively on personalities and, 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 and the attention on individuals because the United States of America would not be able to stomach the actual conduct. So in many ways, those of us who understand the biblical teaching on this matter, we've kind of, many of us unknowingly, have gone along with, the after the ball strategy by refusing to speak candidly about what's going on and in in addition to that many people are ignorant as to what goes on and so how do you think that after the ball strategy has impacted the advancement of things like the equality act and the social acceptance of this conduct that the bible calls abominable i think it was a brilliant strategy i have to give them credit for it i think it was devilish in terms of what it did because it was systematized brainwashing of the the victims in this, which for me are the most important. I, I I sympathize with the Christians who don't want to make a cake, you know, for a wedding, or or churches who don't want to have to deal with gay weddings at their church. I sympathize with those people, but my real heart goes to the people who are calling themselves gay right now because they have been systematically abused, and they don't even know it, and nobody's acknowledging it, and the, the loved ones around them think that they are helping them and loving them by feeding the abuse. The abuse is the fact that they have been told that their identity is equated with a sex act that takes away their dignity. Mm. And because of the fact that they can't really speak openly about what happens in the sex act, they, they have no lifeline, they have no rescue to get out from this trap that they're in. And it breaks my heart because I do love them as people. And I don't think that they're gay. I don't look at them as a different class of people at all. I think that the label itself is so abusive. But what what those strategists did in the gay movement was they looked at what were people's vulnerable points. They knew that there were a lot of young boys growing up in school who got made fun of for being girlish or for having a lisp or for being a little bit weird or for liking musicals. And they reached out to those people and they said, look, obviously you're alone. You're hurting. People are mistreating you. We're going to treat you better because you're going to be part of our community, and the reason for this, we have an explanation for why you're so unhappy. It's because you are gay, because gay is this identity that you're born with. And the worst thing you can do right now is to try to stop being gay, because you can't. And if you try to get out of being gay, you're going to end up killing yourself. So just throw yourself into the community, and oh, by the way, this means you have to make yourself sexually available for sex acts that allow you to be exploited and harmed and dominated and manipulated by other men who will use you for a fleeting sexual moment that won't even really give you any kind of fulfillment. I mean, if you think about how sick that is, and I wish that the conservatives would have looked at the focus 
on, on those people who have been recruited into this, um, who I think in many cases are innocent because they just didn't have the mental strength to withstand the propaganda and the personal pressure that was put on them. And in many cases, they were molested or they were abused or they were groomed. Um, and we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the prevalence of how the gay community actually brings people into their identity group. Often it's through grooming, it's through peer pressure, and it is through actual sexual abuse. Hmm. Now, man, there's so many things I want to say in response to that. In, in your piece, you write, you write this, quote, you said, LGBT activists, and this is assuming that Equality Act passes, ultimately, LGBT activists will demand access to children through school curricula. They will insist upon the right to groom them and coax them into identifying as gay or trans. In essence, they lay claim to the right to prepare them. <coughs> I'm turning the page. Sorry. Prepare, to, prepare them to be their future sex partners. They will force people who experiment with gay sex to remain in the gay sex pool via laws that ban any counseling to help them leave. The Equality Act will force everyone to lie. We will have to tell innocent children that they have two daddies when they do not. Then we, then we will have to tell confused teenagers that they are girls when they are boys. We will have to tell miserable and suicidal homosexuals that their unhappiness derives from external homophobia. Robert, is that hyperbole, or do you see that on the horizon as being the actual reality should this thing pass? It is there. It's, that is the Equality Act. It, you, all you have to do is look at the Human Rights Campaign's educational initiatives. They're already trying to get the curriculum into schools for kids as young as kindergarten, first grade. I went to an event where I, I had all of these citizens in Austin who were trying to stop the Austin Independent School District from imposing heavily sexualized curriculum, introducing the topic of homosexuality to kindergartners and kids in preschool. Um, and, you know, and we had a, a town hall meeting, and a bunch of the gay activists came, and we basically said there is no reason that you need to be giving these kids lessons in this. That they're, it, they're not, they can't process it. Nobody is gay at the age of four because nobody has a sexuality at that age. And the activists came and they said, no, you don't understand. All of us, we knew that we were gay by the age of four, so these kids must know, must know that they're gay. And I said to them, you're projecting your own sexual fantasies under four-year-olds. Do you see how this is abusive? This is so fertile for abuse. And why would they want that other than if it, it is exactly what I said? They, they want to be able to imprint upon these kids an identity and a worldview that will make them the future sex partners of the gay community. That, mm. That's exactly what they're trying to do. There, there's no other explanation for it, because you cannot justify why you would need to talk to a five- or six-year-old about homosexuality and homosexual acts. Why would you even need to introduce that topic to them? Yeah, now, some right. of these activists, they said, but we're not talking about the actual mechanics of the sex act. We're just mm. talking about the identity. And I said, that's even worse. You're bringing them in under false pretenses. They, they think they're going to be joining this cultural identity, and they're going to be getting all of this social support, when really what it is is they're being put in the pipeline to engage in sex acts that they might, if they really knew the truth of it, not want to start down the road with. Mm. You know, and uh, these activists, I, I then challenge them about why they have all these laws against reparative therapy or any kind of counseling to help people get out of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Why would you need to do that if there are people who want to stop that activity? And you can think of so many legitimate reasons why. Why would you want to pass laws to stop people from getting help to get out of homosexuality? It's clear that they have a, an interest, a vested interest in building up their sex pool. Mm. They do it by trying to get the kids in young and locking them in. So they flood kids with titillating material that makes them think about homosexuality. They put them in places where it's likely that they will experiment with it. Once they experiment with it, they put pressure on the kids to interpret their own reaction as a sign that they really are gay. Then they flood them in with all this false propaganda that people are born gay and can't change. And then they stop anybody from talking to them about the possibility that maybe the experimentation was not a reflection of who they are, and they have a chance at having a normal heterosexual life, and they can get out of that sexual community. That, that is what we're talking about. It is a, a systematic manipulation of somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the population. And I don't understand why the country is not up in arms. I don't understand why conservatives, and I, I, I'm sorry if I sound really frustrated, sir. I, I don't want to you know, sound angry, but I don't understand why conservatives are still talking about these ancillary side issues, like you know, whether uh, it's going to protect a, a religious liberty exemption. You know what I mean? I, obviously, I want religious liberty. I want to protect that. But, you're, but the meat of this is that we're sexually abusing and sexually People. distorting and People, really kind yeah. of harming 
such a large part of the population, and I don't understand why people are not furious about it. Yeah, and you made a statement um, in, in your piece. You said so here on the radio, and this is something that I think gets pushed to the margins, that in order to participate, and, and, and I'm not trying to be you know, sensationalistic or anything like that, but to say that the banner for this activity is love that requires the abuse, the physical abuse of a person that you are professing to love is in itself inexplicable uh, because you have to, by biological reality, inflict violence, if you will, on the person you're engaging with. And I know this is yeah. uncomfortable to talk about, but this is the reality of what we're dealing with, is it not? It is the reality. I mean, there, because ultimately, uh, the male, all, of, all males have the same basic body. I mean, it's not like gay men have different organs or a different heart or lung or sex organs. It's, it's the same body. So if two men who have a male body are trying to get together and they want to, they're going to feel the natural urge to express themselves to the other person uh, using that body part, you know what I mean, in an right. act that is intercourse. Yeah. But the problem is that the only way that you can do that with another man is you have to abuse parts of his body that cannot handle that repeated abuse. It doesn't matter if you sleep with the same man 5,000 times and you never sleep with anybody else, or if you sleep with 500 different men, that repeated abuse of that part of your body will harm you. It yeah. will harm you. And, and the thing about it is that the sex act, it won't bring you the fulfillment and the intimacy and the connection. And I say this as someone who has been with a woman for 20 years and tried for 15 years to be with men. Mm. It's not the same thing. It's not equivalent. We have to stop pretending that there is any similarity between what two men do and between what a man and a woman do. Let me jump in right it's, there. Let me jump in right there, Robert, because the break is going to grab us. But on the other side of the break, I want to continue this conversation. And then I want to ask you about your particular walk towards freedom in this area. Stay, stay close, everybody. So you sit down and do your budget and you look at all your monthly costs and your bills and your income and it seems like there's never quite enough. You know what would really help. Finding $500 a month to help balance things out. That is the typical savings. $500 a month for a family when you switch to MediShare for your health care. And when it comes to health care sharing ministries... MediShare is really the gold standard. It's been around for 25 years and has more than 400,000 members. It's been around so long and grown so much because it works. And whether you're single or married or have kids, this could make sitting down to do a monthly budget a lot more fun. $500 a month can more than cover a car payment or pay back loans, whatever. So join MediShare and go out to dinner to celebrate. Here's the number to call. They are incredibly kind and helpful to talk to. 833-44-BIBLE. That's 833-44-BIBLE. 833-44-BIBLE. What has changed the country and the church? This is David Wheaton, host of The Christian Worldview. Over the last many decades, our country has cast off biblical foundations in favor of humanistic values. And the evangelical church, instead of obeying the call to be separate from the world, has become more like it. Satan and our sin nature are always at work, but where that work has been most effective is through higher education, whether at secular or Christian colleges and even seminaries where an orthodox understanding of scripture is undermined. Truly does the Bible say, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Hear more at thechristianworldview.org and then tune in this weekend for another topic that will sharpen your worldview. Listen to The Christian Worldview with David Wheaton, Saturday mornings at 8 Central on American Family Radio. Fox News Commentary with Todd Starnes. Hello, Americans. Walking out on the VP. That story coming up. Thousands of students gave Vice President Mike Pence a standing ovation at Taylor University the other day, but a few dozen graduates and faculty walked out, and that was the bigger news for the mainstream media. About 40 disgruntled snowflakes and leftist faculty members pitched a royal hissy fit after the Christian University refused to rescind the VP's invitation. They said they feared they would feel unsafe at their own graduation. For the record, there were no reports of any graduates being harmed by the vice president.
University administrators should be commended for sticking by the vice president and telling the students to basically grow up. As for the faculty members who walked out, well, the administration should have told those folks to keep on walking. I suspect they'll feel much more comfortable teaching at godless places like Berkeley or Harvard. I'm Todd Starnes. That's your Fox News commentary. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net and UrbanFamilyTalk.com. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. Welcome back to the Hamilton Quarter here on American Family Radio and Urban Family Talk. My guest uh, for this program today has been, is, not has been, Professor Robert Lopez from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And I'm just going to tell you straight up. Uh, Professor Lopez is just laying the axe to the root and exposing uh, the, the reality of this um, horrendous lifestyle, just to, quite frankly. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm addressing this because I agree with what you said, Professor Lopez, in your piece and here on the show, that it's almost as if a siren song has gone out into where we kind of skirt around some of the major issues. And, and I get it. You know, as Christians, we don't like to talk about unseemly things and, and things of that nature. But I'm saying if if there's the, you know, the big bad wolf is coming to blow down your house, you're not going to say, oh, there's a big bad wolf in the in the gentle breeze going outside. You know what I'm saying? And so right. I, th- I, I think know. people always bring up Philippians 4, 8 to me when they say, you know, only think on things that are excellent and noble and true. But I always tell them, you know, some of the things that are noble are when you're able to overcome difficulties. And yeah. I always throw back at them the line from Ephesians, you know, that uh, Paul tells us, don't take part in the acts of darkness, but expose them. Expose them. Uh, you know, we have to get the truth out that the truth will set you free. Jesus says whatever is whispered is going to be shouted from the rooftops. So I, I think that so much clarity would come to this issue if all sides of the issue would really discuss the physical reality, because that's mm-hmm. the one part of it that you'll notice. They'll never let me anywhere near a debate. They'll never let anyone who's going to talk about this anywhere near a debate. They routinely fire doctors who frankly discuss their own experience treating male homosexual patients for the kind of bodily damage that results from the sex act. They're just completely hiding this. There was a novel by uh, Larry Kramer called Faggots. I hate to use that word, but that's actually the title of the novel. And it describes all of the sex practices in the 1970s. And this was before they knew about AIDS. Mm. And he was describing it. And that book, do you know, when I tried to find a copy of it in the Los Can't Angeles Public it. Library, almost all the copies were removed, mm. even though that was a gay activist who wrote that. They're, they're trying so hard to keep this secret. And I think it's important for people to face up to it, that this is what we are talking about. When you're talking about how you want to support your gay son, Mm -hmm. what you're saying is that you want to send your son into this community where he's going to be hurt and harmed and damaged, and you're signaling that you don't believe that he can change and get out of it, or it's just not important enough for you to try to get him out of it. Mm. And and the Scripture is plainly plain when it says, uh, in in Romans, for example, abusers of your of themselves with mankind, literally just talking about the destruction of of the body. Uh, but I did yeah. want to I did want to to give the opportunity um, for you to share what was the process for you to be delivered from this lifestyle. And I know when I say the word delivered, it makes some people uncomfortable because it's become such an overwhelming phenomenon for many people in our society that the very fact that I'm saying deliverance from this lifestyle, uh, some people say, but no, 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 that can't happen. How did it happen for you, Professor Lopez? Well, for me, there were uh, things didn't go in the order that most ex gay stories to follow. <laughs> I mm-hmm. had cancer, so I had to, I was just, my whole life was, it came to a grinding halt. I had to have a tumor removed, and I was in the basement of a hospital in the Bronx. And at that moment, I was alone. My gay friends basically did not come through for me. I had no one to visit me in the hospital. And at that moment, instead of asking the nurse to call my mother's partner, I asked her to call my dad. And my dad did take care of me, and that made me curious about my dad's side of the family. And so as I was recovering in my dad's house and I was looking at all the photographs of my dad's family, I realized that going back so many generations, there was always a mom and a dad, and they were kids. And I just didn't believe at that moment. I guess I just felt convicted, even though I didn't understand what it meant to be convicted, that um, that I was I would be able to do that. There there was nothing really um, blocking me from doing that as long as I just said I'm going to give this up. I can walk away from this. What what am I clinging to? I've given this a try for 15 years. Why am I staying in this? 
And I started asking out a couple girls, and I, I met my wife, and we fell in love. It was pretty quick. Once I decided to get out, I met my wife within less than a year, and then we were married shortly after that. And we've been together for 20 years. I really came to Jesus um, deep into my marriage because I realized that, um, I, I, you know, that the church that I was attending really wasn't doing the job in terms of really bringing me into my duties as a husband and making me the person that I knew God wanted me to be. So I, I would say that I was truly born again when I was baptized in 2008, which was already nine years into my relationship with my wife. Hmm. So to the person who's listening in, in, in this show, and it's ama- it amazes me how many people listen to this, uh, some people who are out there listening right now, and they're saying that, well, uh, either they have a relative or, or a son or whoever that's struggling in, these particular, in this particular area. Do you have any advice you would offer to, let's say, for example, a parent who, who has a child that's struggling in this area? What advice would you offer them? I think that they know their son or their daughter better than the labels describe them. Mm. You, you know them as Bill or Joe or Suey or Hunter, whatever their name is. You, you know them as a person. And you have to just bank on your relationship with them as a person. I would not make this issue front and center all the time because it's going to get tiresome and you'll get into a rut and and the walls will go up. You know, um, I think that you have to just be prayerful. You have to be supportive. You have to get the truth to them uh, in ways that make it clear that you care about them and you're sharing the truth for them because you love them. Ultimately, there's no easy answer because that person has to decide for themselves. Mm. You know, you can't decide for someone else when they're going to make the shift out. You can make it clear to them that you'll support them if they do, and you have to make sure that there's a whole community, and particularly a church, that will support them if they do, because some churches won't support you if you want to get out of the gay lifestyle. They don't believe you can change. You know, so you have to make sure that there's a support network, because if they do decide to get out of the gay lifestyle, that is one of the hardest things that you can do in America today. It's probably harder to do that than to lose 300 pounds. Hmm. You know, I mean, it takes so much work to disassociate yourself from all of your gay connections, to build up a new community that's going to support you. You have to build up your confidence. I always tell people, don't jump out of a gay community and then immediately start dating. You have to go through a long period of rebuilding yourself. You have to quit pornography. You have to quit masturbation. You've got to sort of give your body a reset, get into an exercise routine so you can feel, you know, your physical presence and feel good about it and and, and have that uh, boost to your confidence. And you have to build up your confidence and your self-esteem so that you can deal with rejection because when you start dating, you're going to get rejected, you know, and you have to have the strength that allows you to overcome disappointments and, and overcome, you know, b- uh, obstacles to things that you, you want. And at that point, then, I would just say, go out with girls and have a good time. You know, you don't have to force yourself to imagine having sex with uh, this girl that you've asked out on a date. Take your time. We're Christian. You don't have to rush to prove your sexual prowess. Mm. You, know, um, you know, wait until you get married. But, you know, go out with girls, see who you like. And eventually, you know, if you disassociate yourself from the influences of the past, and you really put yourself on uh, an activity plan that, that allows you to rebuild your masculinity, rebuild your confidence, and you're looking good because, you know, you're working out, you're taking care of yourself, you, you've put your life kind of back together, and you have a supportive community, then th- there's going to be a moment where there's, there's girls that you're going to meet and you're really going to have a good time with, and you're going to connect with, and you're going to feel bonded to, and, you know, and you're going to want to show her happiness. That's the thing is that you're a man. I'm just going to speak to the men out there, but I'm sure this applies to women too. You're a man. You have the body parts to make a woman happy. Mm. And that's why God made you the way you are. And there's going to be this beautiful moment when you realize, wow, this woman that I love, that I want to spend the rest of my life with, I can give her a happiness with my body that I could never give to a man. Mm. And let me you ask know, That's you, what I would say. And I want to follow this up because with, with the, with the, the, the rampant effort to indoctrinate our children. I mean, you saw it with, with a thankful Alabama stood up against the Arthur program that's depicting a, a same-sex marriage with Mr. Ratburn. Uh, there, there also is a phenomenon where there are young people who may not be fully immersed in the lifestyle, but they are thinking in terms of that they are embroiled in these particular types of attractions. Do you have any advice in that scenario? Oh, if people are just, they find themselves dwelling on it a lot? Yes. Not acting on it, but just thinking about it, dwelling on it, and things of that nature. Yeah, I think it's important to educate them about what the physical reality is going to be. And one of the things that you've got to be aware of when you talk to people who are questioning whether they are gay or not is you have to make it clear to them that all of the the, the joy and the glory and the fanfare that happens when you come out as a teenager, that's going to look really different when you're 35. 
Mm. You know, when you come out as originally as a teenager, your body's not going to show the effects of that repeated sex act for a while. You know, at the beginning, it might you might not feel the effects of it. You're thin, you're good looking. You know, everyone loves youth and beauty in the gay community. So there's going to be a lot of people clustering around you. So you have to make sure that people are educated about the long-term effects so that you have some hedge against the temptation to just throw yourself into it because in the short term, what you see is, oh, if I come out of the gay, uh, of the closet and I, I, I identify as gay and I jump into this, well, I'm going to have all this fun tomorrow and next year. And, and you don't realize how hard it's going to be for you in 20 years. I can speak to that because I spent 15 years in the gay community. And, uh, you know, I, if I had stayed in the gay community, I have no doubt that I would have never had a long-term relationship because it just mm. wasn't working out, you know. Um, but you can't see that when you're 17, or when, or when you're 16, especially when you're being flooded with all of this imagery. So I would educate people with about it so that they understand that. And I think that the Bible clearly tells us that we can take control of our thought life. Amen. You know, Paul tells us in Philippians that we should focus on, on things that are pleasant. Um, we should take every thought captive. And you just have to, you know, fill your day with activities that keep you positive um, and that keep you supported with people around you so that those, even if you do have those thoughts, um, you know, you have to be able to minimize them. I think it's important also to avoid pornography and avoid masturbation and avoid mm -hmm. pornography of all kinds. Some yeah. people have heard that if you watch straight porn, it'll make you straight. And I'm just going to say right now, that makes the problem way worse. You have to avoid all pornography and just keep your, you know, you keep your, your mind uh, focused on productive activities and building yourself as a person, building your career, building your community. And, you know, just you'll, you can ride it out. You know, you'll, you'll be able to get through it. I have one last question for you. We're getting close sure. to the end of the program. And I, I know I'm asking these questions because I believe it will be helpful for our listeners. Uh, many people at this point are aware. I've discussed it on my program, things like the Revoice Conference. There's a move afoot now to convey this idea of saying or gay celibate Christianity or gay Christianity or whatever, which is no Christianity in my view. What is your response to that? Yeah, I don't think it works. I think that, you know, the, the people who are called to celibacy, who are, I guess, the eunuchs or the people that Paul says uh, are blessed with the ability of non-desire so they can serve God and never get married, those are people who don't have sexual obsession. So if you're saying that you're gay and that's how you started the whole conversation is I'm struggling with all of these sexual obsessions, that, that's not you. You're not called to singleness or called to celibacy. You fall under the orders from Paul where he says it's better to marry than to burn. Mm -hmm. You've got to realize that you do have a sexual fire in you, and it is fine to have a sexual fire as long as it is channeled in the right way to give pleasure to a woman in the bonds of marriage or to give pleasure to a man in the case of a woman. So um, I don't think that celibacy works. I, I tend to notice that what ends up happening is, first of all, people don't stick to it. Um, and if they do, they're just miserable because they're wallowing in the thoughts. They're often watching pornography. They're often fantasizing about it, but they're just not letting themselves act on it. And it's just, it's a miserable life. And it's a waste of your gifts because, you know, your sexuality is a gift. You could probably make someone of the opposite sex really happy if you just were open to, you know, dating and, and making yourself available for potential spouses. Dr. Robert Lopez, thank you so much for joining me on the program. I'm going to tell you now, I'll have you back on to discuss these things. And I, and I do agree with you that uh, we need to have more candid conversation as to what is really going on if we're going to be effective in doing what we need to do in being salt and light. So thank you so much for joining me on the thank program. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, I, I invited Dr. Lopez on to the program for that very reason, I, I think in too many s circumstances, we are in many instances dancing around the issue. I know in some cases it is because we, we may not have the, we don't know. We just don't know a lot of the details that he offered today. We just don't know. But I, I think the stakes are so high. And like, as I said before, with, with the consistent efforts like the show author, Mr. Ratburn, and I'm telling you, uh, shout out to Alabama, man. Alabama is doing it. Uh, because they stood up the, the public broadcasting network in Alabama and said, no, we're, gonna, we're not going to air that show with Mr. Ratburn. You know, we have a trust with the citizens in our state, and one of the things that I found interesting is that the head of the, the Alabama public television uh, said that they received a notice from PBS that this episode was coming. Now, why am I saying that? Uh, because I got a, a, a message from a listener to the program who happened to live in, I believe it was North Carolina, who said that, you know, her family 
watch the author show and she allowed her children to watch the show and she was doing something else. So she took a double take and saw that this was going on on the television. So it makes me wonder if Alabama public television got advance notice that the Mr. Rat Burns uh, same sex marriage episode was coming up. Did North Carolina get that same advance notice? Did these other states uh, get advance notice? And if they did, why did they make the decision to let it air instead of doing what Alabama did? And the reason why I'm saying all of this, folks, man, I'm telling you, and it's because I have children myself, but it's not only my children, that other children around our country are being sifted. That they are being sifted by this foolishness. And the time has come for the body of Christ to take a stand. And, and I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of the foolishness. You know, and if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down for what's right and what's true. Standing on the word of God, standing firmly with firm footing for the truth of the gospel because eternity hangs in the balance. And I encourage you to, to do the same thing. So I, I thank Dr. Lopez. I know for some people that was a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, and I understand that. Um, but it's time to tell the truth, man. It's time to tell the truth. But I thank you for tuning into the program. I praise God for his testimony, uh, for Dr. Lopez's testimony of deliverance. Because if you are a person who is listening to me right now, you heard Dr. Lopez, he's, a per he's an example that you too can be set free. And if you do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ and the parting of your sins, today is the day of salvation. Repentance is available to all of us. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American.